it begins here with a siren call from the defense support program satellite silently the satellites scan enemy territory a brilliant flash suddenly erupts from the ground somewhere a missile is launched and the enemy thinks his fire is unseen but a digitized image electronically relayed to a u.s military ground station unleashes in 45 seconds a 21st century arsenal of stunning speed and ferocity Such was the opening of the Persian Gulf War, the ultimate technology war, as General H. Norman Schwarzkopf called it. Never before had the hardware of battle enjoyed such popularity. Never before had America so keenly romanced its own armaments. But what's so special about these weapons? What is it that makes them as fascinating as the men and women who go into combat with them? What are the forces that indelibly link technology and war? It has been said of war that the side with the smartest gadgets will prevail. To make sure that America's weapon systems keep pace with technology, military experts are continually altering and improving them. Today, weapon systems are built so they remain flexible, which allows them to be molded and adapted for a specific battle function. Modern weapon systems share several key characteristics. They must be able to detect locate and lock on to a target. They must do so with the utmost secrecy and speed, and they must be accurate and have a high probability of survival. The underlying power of these new arms exists in technology. From the territory of integrated circuitry and electronics, microprocessors, laser guiding systems, computers that line up target runs for pilots, electromagnetic radar jammers and infrared sensors, Technologies that are present in your car radar detector, your microwave, your fax machine, and your cellular phone. While the concerns of war have been the same for centuries, the need to move rapidly, strike enemy targets, and defend one's own forces, the emphasis on where weapons are deployed has changed radically. Increasingly, air power is becoming the primary military force. Advanced airborne weapon systems have helped our armed forces excel, as witnessed in the Persian Gulf War. But no one technology can take all the credit for turning the tide. It was the resourceful combination of technologies, both new and old, that helped the Allied forces gain the upper hand. To be invisible to your enemy, is a traditional military strategy. To attack stealthily before you can be seen. It was a stealth fighter that fired the first shot in the Persian Gulf War. The image of it dropping a 2,000 pound GBU paveway guided smart bomb through the roof of Baghdad's main communication center came to represent war's high tech focus. The F-117A stealth fighter is the world's first operational aircraft designed to pass through enemy territory undetected. Its angular bat-like form is covered with radar-absorbing tiles. 
fitted all over the fuselage in an arrangement called faceting. Their angles are carefully calculated to deflect and scatter radar waves. For an aircraft flying a strike mission, the ability to foul radar is essential. For U.S. Marine Corps Colonel John Sullivan, all aspect stealth will be an integral part of future tactical fighters. If, if the mission, uh, as in uh, Iraq, if the mission is to go in and take out uh, the air defense uh, systems, the uh, command and control systems, and to do that uh, with precision bombing, low risk, then you want to send in a stealth vehicle. And right now, uh, particularly in uh, built-up areas, such as in and around Baghdad and other cities, where you want to avoid collateral damage, you, you want to ensure that you hit the target with military value and not other targets, then that requires a, a manned vehicle to do that. And that's a perfect operation for a, a stealth vehicle. This single-seater fighter is flown by pilots of the Tactical Air Command's 37th Tactical Fighter Wing. The F-117A can employ a wide range of weapons and features sophisticated navigation and attack systems that makes the pilot's job easier. The F-117A's dark cousin is the B-1B bomber. Another top-of-the-line strategic penetrator, the B-1B is an essential part of America's defenses and can carry both nuclear and conventional warheads. With unique warning systems and terrain-following radar, the B-1B is a very potent fighting machine. Its real strengths are its maneuverability and its acceleration and control response. This agile, high-speed aircraft is almost impossible to shoot down and can carry a payload greater than that of the B-52 and drop it with greater accuracy. While every aircraft will eventually have to have some degree of stealth, the high cost of the technology currently prohibits all aircraft from incorporating it. But the lack of it doesn't necessarily detract from air supremacy. Stealth has an, has an important uh, role to play, but it's, it's rather a limited scenario. And the air war, as we saw it fought in the Persian Gulf in Operation Desert Storm, was the classic uh, air war that, uh, that we would like to fight, and that is we go in first and we uh, uh, knock out their command and control. We, we knock out their uh, enemy air so that there is absolutely no opposition to our forces. And when we have complete air superiority, uh, so what if you're, if you're not stealthy? If you can knock down the uh, surface-to-air missiles, if you can knock down the AAA uh, that the other guys got, you don't have to worry about being stealthy. If not stealthy, what then? Fast? Agile? Powerful? The F-14 Tomcat is America's air-to-air -to -air top gun. Able to travel at speeds well over Mach 2, its remarkable record in head-to-head -head combat is unparalleled. Its highly maneuverable swing wings automatically adjust to a given flight regime. Swept back for supersonic flight and swept forward for low energy motion in close encounter dogfights, its swift, smart missile release is controlled by the AWG-9 radar system. For Grumman's Mike Fusco, it is the most advanced radar system in the world. The, uh, the radar has a very powerful transmitter and it's able to scan a very large volume of space looking for targets at very long ranges. Once it finds detections, it can track those targets for as long as it's in its scan volume. It could track 24 or more targets and then allow the operator to employ missiles against them. The F-14, if it doesn't want to be radiating RF, it also has an infrared search and track system, so it can passively uh, look for targets at very long ranges without the enemy detecting that you're there because you're not radiating anything. The F-14 also has a television camera set that can magnify an image at a long range and allow you to ID a target at a much longer range than you could with your normal eye. Speed, power, and grace. Before the advent of stealth technology, our tactical fighters were designed to outmaneuver their Soviet counterparts. 
Aircraft like the F-15 Eagle and the F-16 Falcon are both extremely fast, highly maneuverable, and are designed to gain and maintain air superiority in aerial combat. With hair-trigger acceleration, the Eagle is the first U.S. operational aircraft whose engine's thrust exceeds the plane's loaded weight. This allows it to accelerate rapidly, even in a vertical climb. The F-15 is equipped with highly advanced electronic systems and weaponry to acquire, track, and attack enemy aircraft. It is capable of carrying a wide variety of arms, including Sparrow missiles and Sidewinder missiles. When the pilot changes from one weapon system to another, visual guidance for the selected system automatically appears on the head-up display. The F-16's key mission is striking ground targets behind enemy lines. But it's also formidable in air-to-air -air combat. Truly an aircraft for the 21st century, its lean form allows tight and fluid motion. The Falcon's characteristic bubble canopy affords the pilot almost 360-degree sight lines. The cockpit includes a heads-up display and multiple CRT screens that offer instant updates on navigation, engine performance, or weapon status. The new F-16s are equipped with Lantern, low-altitude navigation and targeting infrared for night system, and a global positioning system that increases accuracy of position, velocity, and time information for coordinating all weather-accurate bomb hits. As technology continues to evolve, so does the role of the manned aircraft, where we once had the luxury to build fighters only to fight other planes, and bombers to just deliver ordnance. We now require more of our aircraft to be able to fight their way to targets, deliver bombs or missiles, and fight their way back to friendly airspace. Advances in the F-14 and F-15 and F-16 have given them this capability in the Persian Gulf. Once air superiority has been achieved, these aircraft were sometimes called upon to do both roles. But only one aircraft has been designed from the ground up as a fighter and an attacker. The F&A 18 Hornet. The F&A 18 is equally effective in air-to-air -air combat and mid-range ground attack. This single-seater aircraft is structured for traditional strike applications and close air support. Its excellent fighter and self-defense capabilities multiplies the Hornet's strike impact, providing operational commanders with combat flexibility. Equipped with a thermal imaging system and a night vision targeting system, it has a ceiling of over 50,000 feet and an attack range of 550 nautical miles. The FNA 18's weapons includes the 20 millimeter Vulcan cannon, Sparrow 3 missiles for fighter missions, sidewinders for attack missions, and both guided and conventional air to ground radars. To execute their missions, pilots rely on their ability to acquire a target, known as target acquisition, identify it, attack, and eliminate it. In the past, it was incumbent upon the pilot to navigate his airplane to a point where he could look outside and recognize the target, which created a high degree of exposure to enemy fire. Today's technology helps the pilot locate and lock in targets from distances far beyond his visual range, an innovation much appreciated by A6 pilot Mike Shaw. Well, if I could shoot a missile from 60 miles, I would much rather do that than have to fly the airplane and overfly the target because, as you can well expect, anything that's valuable enough for me to call a target is probably valuable enough for the enemy to heavily defend it. And if I have to fly through that, no matter how much high-tech stuff I've got in the airplane, I'm giving him plenty of opportunities to shoot at me, and I don't want to do that. I mean, the, the cost of a missile may be high, but compared to the loss of an airplane and an air crew, it's uh, a very expensive very cost-effective trade-off. Of all the buzzwords to come out of the Persian Gulf conflict, the term smart weapons has been the most widely used and abused terminology. By definition, a smart weapon is one that is autonomous, 
which can find the target without anyone telling it where the target is. While this concept sounds good, the reality is that few weapons are completely autonomous. They all need human guidance of some kind. Some are guided by radar, like the AMRAAM, or advanced medium-range air-to-air missile designed for launch and leave and multiple target engagements. The pilot can detect a threat, lock on to the target, fire the AMRAAM, turn and go on to the next target as the AMRAAM continues to pursue on its own its predetermined mission. Some are so fast that the target has little time to outmaneuver it, like the Phoenix missile. Once fired, the Phoenix travels at speeds in excess of 3,000 miles per hour and can cover over 100 nautical miles. But smart isn't always better. According to SDI specialist and former B-52 pilot Steve Fout, the oldest plane in the inventory proved to be a useful tool in pinning down and destroying a rock's elite Republican guard by using dumb iron bombs and lots of them. In one B-52, you put 55 to 60, maybe as many as 80, depending on how you load the airplane, 500-pound bombs. Let's, let's take a middle number, 75 500-pound bombs that you bomb in an area and just say, take that area, and if you're in there, you're dead, versus trying to put 75 million dollar weapons you, you can't afford to do that for very long so what you do is you take the high-tech weapon to go into an area where you require this precision you know exactly where the target is you want to eliminate collateral damage Saddam Hussein tried to hide a lot of his command posts and things like that in civilian areas without precision guided munitions we couldn't go in and get them given that PGM or I could literally stick it down the heater vent and you tell, well, Mr. Hussein, I know where you put it, and take that, and I do it with one weapon. I can't do that with a B-52, but I can't afford to bomb the area with the precision weapon, so you actually need both. No weapons have sparked the imagination of the American public more powerfully than the two showstoppers of the Persian Gulf conflict, the Patriot missile and the Tomahawk cruise missile two of the smartest weapons made today. Dr. Jack Ledger of the U.S. Army's Intelligence School explains how the Patriot has already found its way into American folklore. I think the best story I heard that came out of here, uh, this whole thing, was how people interpret what's happened and the interpretation of the Iraqi lieutenant reporting to Saddam Hussein and saying, they've been shooting those Patriots at us, but we got everyone but one. <laughs> the Patriots' radar station pinpoints incoming rockets and low-missile launches. The single radar, using phased array technology, provides all tactical functions of surveillance, target detection and tracking, and missile guidance support. During battles, the only manned element on the unit is the engagement control station for automated operations. But how accurate is the Patriot? It's a very good high-altitude system, which later gets rolled in through SDI into being a last-ditch ballistic missile defense against nuclear weapons. Now, let's remember, nuclear weapons. So it's against high-flying aircraft, fast movers, and nuclear weapons. That's what it's built for. We roll it into Israel, Israel Saudi Arabia, against a Scud, which is a fast-moving ballistic missile, but not a warhead anymore, so you don't have the same amount of time. Um, if you're talking strategic ballistic missiles, you've got 35 minutes worth of time. Scuds, you're talking 8, 9, 10 minutes worth of time. You've got to react much faster. He's not going as high in altitude. May not be quite as predictable. It still hits him. It hits him with unbelievable precision. Um, it got a lot of shrapnel on the ground. And there were some critics that said Patriot didn't work because parts fell everywhere. He says, now, wait a minute. Let's go back and look at how this was designed against a nuclear warhead. It's going to go up and blow a nuclear warhead up, and there's going to be some shrapnel fall. There's going to be a little bit of fallout around. I'm going to give you a choice. A little bit of shrapnel around or a nuclear detonation. Your pick. I'll take a little bit of shrapnel. No sweat. A Navy spokesman once said of a Tomahawk cruise missile that it was possible to aim at RFK Stadium in Washington, D.C., fire it from downtown Boston, and target it right between the goalposts. A highly survivable weapon 
the tomahawk is nearly impossible to shoot down because its very small cross-section makes radar detection difficult. Navy Captain Bill Neville of the Naval War College explains how the tomahawk has expanded power projection for the Navy. The tomahawk uh, cruise missile that was featured uh, being fired off the battleships during the Gulf War is a smart weapon. It, um, it's a weapon that once it's fired, you no longer have to maintain a track on it. You no longer have to continue to communicate it with it in flight in order for it to reach its objective. It embodies uh, terrain following technologies, radars that look down, that match uh, that radar picture with a preloaded picture of what route it should fly, and essentially then becomes a, a pilotless vehicle, but with, with a digital pilot, if you will, uh, that is able to follow a pre-prepared route and strike a, a target uh, using radar uh, signatures to make the identification. Picatinny Arsenal is the free world's largest armament research and development facility, where the U.S. Army is working on new weapons that will one day have to be even smarter. Vincent Marchese, chief of improved sensing munitions, explains. We had the luxury in Iraq and Kuwait of having um, air cover, and we were able to designate with lasers um, where, the, where the targets were. In, in the next confrontation, we may not have that uh, luxury, and in, in a lot of cases, the Army can't control what the Air Force is going to do with respect to uh, designations. So that the next generation of munitions, which we are working on, um, will find the targets all by themselves without having to have somebody designate them. And that, that eliminates a person having to fly forward or be on the ground forward of our own troops because artillery normally fires 15 to, to uh, you know, uh, 18 miles away. And to have somebody up there to, to shine a, a laser beam on, on a the target is uh, impractical. So what we would like to do is come up with um, munitions which are slightly smarter than the ones that we did use, uh, ones that can go and find the target by themselves with the same effect and, uh, and, and not even expose the, the person with the laser beam. Picatinny Arsenal is responsible for the development of SAD arm, or Sense and Destroy Armor, a truly smart weapon. Uh, SAD arm will, um, uh, will look out over the battlefield before it begins its engagement, determine what kind of a day it is. Uh, is it cold? Is the snow out? Is it raining? Uh, how windy is it? That sort of thing. And, and determine um, just how to set, uh, set up it, its parameters. Six pods are launched over the battlefield inside a missile. At a predetermined point, the submunitions are dispensed so you get a pattern of SAD arms in the air six at a time. Each one will individually search out a target and fire an explosively formed projectile. We can take this metal liner, pack a couple of pounds of explosive behind it, and as long as it's within the, uh, the, the submunitions uh, case, when the explosive goes off, we can tailor the explosive and the dimensions on this, uh, on this liner so that the force of the explosion will turn this disc inside out so that this part becomes the, um, the, the leading part of it. And the force of the explosion imparts a tremendous velocity, several thousand feet per second. The weight and the velocity is essentially the kill mechanism. We are generating a bullet while we are, uh, while we are falling. There is no bullet in the submunition when it starts. There's just this liner. But this liner, by the force of the explosion, is transformed into a bullet that looks something like this plastic model. Okay. What we've done is uh, uh, we, we've made a, ma a machined model of something that uh, only exists for, for a few fractions of a second, uh, and then upon impact um, uh, causes uh, an awful lot of devastation. The same technology is being used in WAN, or Wide Area Mine, the latest in mine technology. It detects acoustically and seismically that a vehicle is approaching and fires a warhead over the top of the target, which detonates the explosively formed projectile. A ship is one of the most adaptable platforms for high-tech weaponry. 
most of the classic vessels of the Navy are veterans of several battles. And while their older hulls haven't changed much, their decks have undergone many radical transformations in the theater of war. They are the floating stages on which men and new war machines interact to create a total fighting environment. Captain Billy Cornett, an operations professor at the Naval War College, is a specialist in sea control and war at sea. The issue of war at sea is always to try to reach a little further than what you have as an enemy. If you find that you can't reach out further to get him before he can get you, then you need to protect yourself. Uh, technology has taken us to the point where we feel much more comfortable at sea. Technology also extends to the issue of command and control and bringing individual ships together as a fighting force at sea. We're able to uh, work not just as a ship at sea, but the extension of aircraft, which includes naval air, air force air, allied air, and to, if necessary, project force or to project power, which it would involve for the Marines and the Army. Among the battleships, destroyers, cruisers, and carriers, the technology that adds metal to their force is the Aegis system. The Aegis, integrated as part of the vessel's armory, was designed as a total weapon system. From detection to kill, the heart of the technology is an advanced automatic detect and track multifunction phased array radar. This provides a ship with the capacity to search, track, and guide missiles simultaneously for over 100 different targets from wave top to overhead. In effect, the boat becomes a floating operational missile site. This allows a vessel not only to protect itself, but to protect others that are in company with it. By collecting and analyzing data, the battle force commander can see what's going on on a real-time basis and make critical decisions rapidly that can affect how you fight the enemy. First of all, if you have determined that it is a hostile platform, the decisions that have to be made are the type of weapon system that you want to employ against that platform. Having determined that, then you want to determine who has that type and you assign that platform or that force to engage that particular uh, enemy. Having made those decisions, the next decisions are if that engagement fails, who is going to back that engagement up, and so on and so forth. Destroy the thing which is launching the weapon rather than trying to kill the weapon itself. The weapon becomes a very difficult target, as you can imagine. Each type of vessel has a unique role in the defense pattern at sea. Aircraft carriers fulfill the primary role of sea control, projecting power ashore. Their mission is to deliver combat aircraft that engage in attacks on airborne, ocean, or shore targets. Such flat tops as the Nimitz and the John F. Kennedy continue to be the centerpiece of U.S. maritime strategy. Together with their embarked wings, the carriers have vital roles to play in strikes across the full spectrum of conflict. The pride of the fleet are the Iowa-class battleships, the Missouri and her sister ship, the Wisconsin, are both battle veterans of the Gulf conflict and have conducted sustained combat operations at sea worldwide. Combinations of modern weaponry has transformed these old sea bells into superior fighting platforms, and they too carry an inventory of new arms, such as the Tomahawk and the Harpoon missile. Destroyers such as the Arleigh Burke also carry the Aegis system and operate in support of carrier or battleship groups, amphibious groups, or replenishment groups. But primarily, their function is to perform anti-submarine warfare. Bill Neville explains how all these new technologies work in harmony at sea. There are uh, varied uh, and numerous tools in the toolbox. Uh, depending on the mission and the defenses surrounding the objective, uh, you will go back and do your mission planning 
from that perspective. Uh, in a heavily defended um, objective, particularly against aircraft, then you would do what you saw done in the Gulf, where you would first roll in a, a wave of cruise missiles. Uh, once those have penetrated the defenses, then you would follow it with manned aircraft. If it were within the range of the battleship's naval guns, you would then proceed to bring the battleships in close enough and take them under fire with naval guns. The Navy now fights the battle at much, much further distance than it used to. Uh, the World War II engagements where you were essentially in visual range are no longer those which, uh, which we, we hope to bring about. We hope that all the engagements, and that's what we train for, will be done well over the horizon. Much of the Navy's projected power takes place under the horizon. The attack submarine has been roaming the world's waters for decades. And as retired Captain Timothy Soames explains, the submarine was the original stealth technology. I think most people fail to recognize that uh, long before we invented stealth aircraft, uh, we had a stealth platform uh, which uh, was highly successful in two world wars almost uh, brought Britain to its knees in the First World War, and then we were successful in essentially isolating Japan because uh, of its stealth capabilities. The modern attack submarine uh, has been developed to a, such a high degree of stealth that it literally is uh, undetectable by any nation, so it can move uh, any place in the uh, world's oceans and launch its uh, cruise missiles. In the case of an attack submarine, without the uh, your uh, opponent uh, knowing that they're being launched until uh, the missiles strike the target, they don't know the launch platforms there. They're not aware that the missile is coming in. Uh, literally, it's uh, absolute surprise, which is what happened in the case of the opening uh, salvos against uh, Baghdad and Iraq. In an effort to carry this technology into the 21st century, the Navy is working on a new class of super sub. The Sea Wolf is quieter than anything they have produced before. The nuclear-powered Sea Wolf will feature highly sophisticated sonar systems, more firing capacity, use a variety of electronic sensors and fire control processing equipment, and will include laser-guided missiles, vertical launch and tracking systems for both the Tomahawk and the Harpoon missile. It is a paradox of high-tech weaponry that the technological features that make them such swift and efficient machines of destruction can also minimize devastation in a war. The more complex the hardware, the faster the counteroffensive is implemented, the swifter the battle is resolved. Thus, fewer casualties are incurred. This is evident in one of war's most dangerous episodes, the engagement on the ground. But here, as in other battle arenas, new technology is changing the methods and strategies of ground fighting. Defense analyst Colonel Tom Springer explains how. Technology has changed, whereas the centerpiece of, of, of our warfare in the Army was the tank. Uh, what we saw here in the Persian Gulf is technology has allowed us to, to maybe use as a centerpiece or one of the center, co-centerpiece with the tank the helicopter. The world's premier attack helicopter is the Apache AH-64, a unique combination of grace and power. The Apache is built for speed, immediate surprise attack and agility. It has its own form of stealth and is versatile enough to rise up suddenly from behind a hill, engage and terminate the enemy at fairly close quarters and make a speedy and victorious escape. Tough and adaptable with devastating firepower, it is designed to fight and survive in any war theater in the world. Covered with a ballistic tolerant skin, it is able to withstand hit from rounds up to 23 millimeters. And it has the ability to fight at night as easily as it does during the day. But the key to a helicopter's success is speed. The distance that it can cover, uh, the type of uh, munitions that it can carry, uh, it's able to, to respond quickly, um, and it's able to fire uh, uh, missiles from a look-down mode. Uh, the vulnerability on most armored vehicles is from the top. Uh, 
with the ability of the, the new missiles that they can put onto the uh, helicopter, they're able to, to destroy tanks or armored vehicles uh, exceedingly well. The most advanced feature of the Apache is found in the pilot's helmet. As he turns his head to look at the target, his Hellfire missiles follow. This futuristic advance seems to be taken from the back lot of a science fiction movie. One of the things that uh, you see that you, you may have seen in the movies when you talk about the Apache uh, um, um, pilot is in his helmet he has the capability of, 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 of moving and detecting his target and firing from the, uh, the optical optics that he does have in his helmet. These are things that you, you saw uh, maybe five, ten years ago in, in, in the movies, but now that, that type of technology is being used. But as good as that technology might be, we will still need to face each other head on. As the Persian Gulf War showed us, there is no finer armored ground vehicle than the M1A1 Abrams tank. With crew survivability and its agility, the Abrams is the most effective combat tank the Army has ever fielded. It weighs in at a hefty 63 tons, but can hit close to 42 miles per hour with a full combat load. Used mainly for closing with and destroying enemy forces, the Abrams combines mobility and superior firepower to gain the field. It is the ultimate hit and run weapon, endowed with high science electronics. Its armored steel skin, made of depleted uranium, protects its crew from high impact assault. It also has extraordinary night vision capabilities. Even when you had the smoke and, and, and problems that you had in the Persian Gulf, where um, the, the tanks, the, uh, the T-62 that they were equipped with, were unable to see our tanks because of the, being obscured by the smoke. When you talk about the laser and you talk about the night vision sites that we have, uh, we were able to go through the smoke. And so you were firing on them and destroying them before they even know you were there. The M1 isn't the only high-tech weapon that's used during a ground confrontation. Though not new, the Bradley M2 infantry fighting vehicle is the Army's wheels for mechanized infantry and is a speedy, fully-tracked, lightly armored fighting vehicle. Its relative, the Bradley M3, is the scout and cavalry's conveyance for screening, reconnaissance, and security missions. Both vehicles have a two-man turret with a mounted 25 millimeter automatic stabilized cannon, which is its primary weapon. But for more aggressive firepower, the Bradley shoulders the tow missile system. Among the items of the Army's interactive hardware, the MLRS, or multiple launch rocket system, is a free flight area fire artillery rocket system. On the field and in a tight spot, the MLRS is a very critical presence for forward troops in ground action. It supplements cannon artillery by delivering large volumes of firepower in a short time against key targets. The basic warhead carries conventional munitions, but room for growth in the system does exist to add a terminal guidance warhead and a sense and destroy warhead. One of the ultimate goals of technology is to help develop munitions that will become force multipliers by their effectiveness on the battlefield. This will help to further the armed forces doctrine of downsizing the number of soldiers we hope will be fighting wars in the future. We're talking about fighting on a battlefield, at one that has fewer soldiers. It just, it's too expensive to have armies the size that we have. The other is uh, when you look at, an ar uh, at a battlefield, going to be widely dispersed. As we saw in the Persian Gulf, it made no difference when the Iraqis decided to mass forces. They were able to be detected by technology from uh, great distances, by satellite and by other uh, types of, uh, of radar detecting systems that are on our aircraft. And so every time they massed, they were destroyed. A push-button remote control war 
where weapons will wipe out other weapons and military sites sparing civilians is the dream of many. Despite the sense of unreality in the black shadow of a stealth bomber, or the amazement one feels at seeing a tomahawk on course as it decides to make a right turn, it is unlikely that humans will ever be left out of the weapons loop, no matter how complex the technology gets. But what's in store for the future? The vital linchpin in the new military technology is the power of advanced electronics to gather and disseminate critical data about our enemy. Dr. Jack Ledger is a senior intelligence research advisor at the U.S. Army Intelligence School and a specialist in the modern art of electronic warfare. Well, of course, electronic warfare is associated with all the wizardry of, of electronics, but really, conceptually, it's a very basic thing. Uh, it has to do with manipulating communications, primarily, of whomever your threat or enemy is to your benefit and guarding your communications from having him do the same thing to you. For example, in the airland battle, which was really given a, given a, uh, a test in, in the Persian Gulf, the central core of that is intelligence. Okay? The collection, the knowing of the enemy, the knowing from far out where he is, what his capabilities are, how he's moving, what he's doing, what the indicators are, and so forth. Those same indicators, those same parameters, are the things that steer electronic warfare. But intelligence gathering isn't new just the way we go about doing it. But if you look back in your civil law books, you see balloons, you see people peering down from balloons, gathering intelligence. So as, as the nature of our communication, the nature of our ability to move changed, we began to adapt and, you know, all of those means to the gathering and utilization of intelligence. When we got to electronics, it became very apparent that it could be not just a gathering thing, but it could be an active thing to disable or whatever uh, the enemy's capabilities. So really what we're, we're looking at now is a, a combination of looking at command, looking at control, looking at communications. We put those together and they form an intelligence base for us to take actions on the battlefield. The real benefit of electronic warfare is in the closing up of boundaries across the spectrum of the armed forces as they unite their firepower, soldiers and new weapons in a unified effort. One of the real watersheds uh, in this Operation uh, Desert Storm was uh, the integrated use of all forces, air, sea, and land, to produce an overall effect against uh, the Iraqi forces, which caused literally, it caused literally systemic failure. They were unable to cope with the fact that we were coming at them from, uh, from the sea, from the air, and from the land simultaneously, and moving at such a rapid pace uh, with the entire uh, force control orchestrated, if you will, uh, in such a manner that they were unable to cope. And what happened is we saw wholesale surrenders. It was this very ability to manage very large forces that gave us the ability to put these forces in a very short period of time. We then were able to, through these same, the same uh, data processing, uh, to orchestrate, to, uh, to manage huge amounts of information in terms of uh, the Iraqi force disposition and all the other uh, information that a modern uh, military sh machine needs to know. Get that information out to every unit down to the individual tactical unit, uh, keep track of it all, allow our forces to navigate over the essentially featureless desert in so much, such a way that the commanders knew and the individual uh, elements knew exactly where they were. And we could put all that together and as I said, in a manner which essentially uh, overwhelmed the Iraqis so they simply couldn't cope and systemically failed. The promise of even higher technology is just on the horizon as weapons become increasingly open to redesign and further innovations. The B-22A Osprey hybrid aircraft is a cross between a plane and a helicopter. It has a 38-foot rotor system and an engine mounted on each wing, and it can operate as a helicopter for vertical takeoff and landing and can also resort to horizontal flight. This gives it remarkable maneuverability. The new breed of advanced tactical fighters is embodied in the structure of the F-22 with a wingspan of over 43 feet. This system can turn its rear tail flat to the airstream to act as brakes. The F-22 is a prototype aircraft that will replace the F-15 Eagle as the Air Force's fighter by the end of the 1990s. 
It was designed borrowing and adapting features from the F-117A and the B-2 bomber. The 1990s could easily be the decade of the forward swept wing. Now a main feature of the experimental X-29, the design holds promise for a whole new generation of tactical fighters. Initial tests on the X-29 shows that the radical wing form produces a better performance than conventional wings, offering more maneuverability and improved slow speed handling. The Grumman design features a variable trailing camber wing that changes its angle to optimize airflow. The Persian Gulf War validated many of our military concepts and has demonstrated that the technologies we were counting on to give us the edge has done that very successfully. But technological triumph brings in its wake a host of questions. Do high-tech weapons really mean shorter wars, less lives lost? And what happens to our deterrent strength when we find that other nations have caught up to a point where we find the same sophisticated weapons aimed at us? That same thing is going to be an Achilles heel for us. The technology that we need now is how do you counter that precision guided missile? because we must mass also in future battles. How do we counter that? How do we counter uh, uh, the type of, of missiles that, are, that we use? Because you know that there are going to be uh, third world countries, there are going to be other superpowers that saw what happened in the Persian Gulf with our high technology weapons, and they are going to be after them, after them and they are going to either buy them or they're going to develop them. So now it's a matter of we are going to be on the other end and how do we defend against that? And technology is going to pay, play a great role in our ability to defend against those types of weapons. Deterrence at best has always meant an uneasy peace with the threat of aggression ever present in our arms. As we continue to develop new military technologies, will we evolve a new morality to match the efficacy of our modern weapons. In the last analysis, fighting can never be simply left to a machine. A gun doesn't fire without a command. Our current weapons are not just faceless innovations, but instruments of power still wielded by human hands. And to make war, to strike the first blow or the last, is still a very human decision. In the shadow of these advanced armaments, we hope to gain a new wisdom that will help us manage their lethal potential. is 2003. The aircraft is the United States Advanced Tactical Fighter, the F-22. It is the culmination of a century of air technology in which America's air forces have grown from a single biplane glider equipped with a 12 horsepower motor to the magnificent military and civilian aircraft of today. A short 100 years before, on December 17, 1903, the Wright brothers made the initial motor-driven flight. 
This is the 1908 flight of the world's first military plane, the Wright twin-engine biplane, Model A. Top speed, 42 and one half miles an hour. Much better than the 1903 flights in Kitty Hawk, North Carolina. There were four flights that day. Number one lasted a full 12 seconds. The final flight traveled some 852 feet, staying aloft for 59 seconds. In 59 seconds, the F-22 can fly at maximum speed more than 30 miles. But speed is only one element in the composition of a superior fighter plane, which is made up of many key characteristics. I'm confident that if you interviewed a thousand fighter pilots, those aviators would tell you their ideal flying machine would have uh, the speed of light, the agility of a polo pony, and it would also be bulletproof and invisible. Uh, first of all, the airplane uh, has to have the range to get where you want it to go. Uh, number two is the airplane has to have the maneuverability. Uh, it, also, that the airplane has to be lethal. It has to carry a sufficient number of weapons. It also has to be able to uh, uh, get what we call first look, first kill. These characteristics have not changed since the first skirmishes in World War I. They are speed, maneuverability, weapon systems, and the ability to come upon the enemy undetected. Today, the term is stealth. What are the advances in technology which have given America's fighter planes air superiority in the past, today, and in the future? I can think of no other vehicle that is produced by humans that so dramatically develop, demonstrates the uh, evolution of technology. You have uh, airframe technology, uh, just the, the basic machine itself. We've seen this come from uh, 80 horsepower rotary engines in World War I to uh, uh, jet engines that produce thousands and thousands of pounds of thrust today. Speed in aircraft is no different than speed in our animal kingdom. There are many different kinds with many different purposes. The short burst needed by an antelope to escape the jaws of a hungry tiger. The powerful, enduring speed of the hunting horse. The quickness of the thoroughbred over a mile and a sixteenth. The first fighter planes of World War I had the energies and strength of any newborn. They were quick to respond, but also quick to tire. The French-made Newport 11 was typical of the period. Mostly wood-framed, fabric-covered, with a top speed of 97 miles per hour. A ceiling of 15,000 feet took over 20 minutes to reach. From the beginning, Americans were involved in this conflict. As members of the French Foreign Legion, as volunteer ambulance drivers, and as pilots in the famous Lafayette Escadrille, many flying the Newports. When the United States joined the Allies in 1917, our newly formed air service, having no American-made aircraft, turned to the French SPADs. First, the SPAD-7, with its 180 horsepower hispano suiza V piston engine, generating a maximum speed of 118 miles per hour. By war's end, we were flying the SPAD-13, with its 220 horses, getting up to 139 miles per hour and climbing to 13,000 feet in 12 minutes and 30 seconds. The Germans' most acclaimed Fokker D7 had a maximum speed of 124 miles per hour. After the First World War, speed continued to dominate. 
private industry, trying to satisfy an air-conscious public and disinterested military, filled the record books with faster, higher, longer statistics. A typical example, the Verville Pursuit Racer. In 1920, this racer set a speed record of 186 miles per hour, but proved very unstable and was never manufactured in quantity. Many of those records, plus some other major air advancements, were set by James H. Jimmy Doolittle. A record 232 miles per hour in a pontoon monoplane. The first completely blind instrument flight. He flies the GB-1 over 300 miles an hour, setting another transcontinental speed record to win the Thompson Trophy. As the thunderclouds of World War II began to appear on the horizon, the U.S. Air Corps found itself in much better shape than in the war to end all wars. While not yet prepared to engage in a major conflict, there were American classics on the drawing board. Uh, I flew the P-38 and the P-51 in uh, World War II in, out of England. Uh, we had to have extra gas tanks, you know, auxiliary tanks to uh, fly along with the bombers as long as possible. And then uh, whenever we got into a fight of any kind, we of course dropped our auxiliary tanks and we were on internal fuel alone. The P-51 Mustang. The P-38 Lightning. Two of the great American World War II fighters. Along with the P-47 Thunderbolt, the British Spitfire and others, these planes helped achieve air supremacy for the Allied forces. The eye-catching twin-engine P-38 created excitement from its inception. Two weeks after its maiden flight, the Lightning crossed the continent in an astounding seven hours, two minutes. The Republic P-47, introduced on May 6, 1941, was the American numbers champion, with over 15,600 airframes manufactured. The P-47B and its over 2,500 horsepower Pratt & Whitney engine would reach 433 miles per hour with excellent performance qualities at 20,000 feet. The P-51 is considered by many America's greatest fighter plane. Challenged to deliver the prototype in 120 days, the fighter was conceived, designed and constructed in 102 days. The P-51D, powered by a Packard Merlin engine, could hit a maximum speed of 448 miles per hour, climb like a mountain goat, and outlast a camel with a maximum radius of 1,300 miles, able to protect our bombers longer and farther than the other pursuit planes. It was flown by more than 40 American fighter groups and 31 RAF squadrons. Early in 1944, the German Messerschmitt 262 signaled the first dramatic change in air warfare since the inception of flight. Jet power, capable of outflying, outdistancing, and outmaneuvering any prop plane. The skies would never be the same. Our top speed was five, six times as uh, high as the ones in, uh, in uh, World War I. And the present airplanes, the F-15, the F-15, 16, the F-14, are all uh, capable of flying five or six times as fast as the uh, ones of uh, World War II. Our first significant jet fighter was the Lockheed F-80 Shooting Star, put into service in 1947 by the now fully autonomous United States Air Force, which reached that status the same year. In 1943, the Army Air Force, under heavy military demands, pressured Lockheed to build a low-wing, tricycle-geared, conventional single-seat jet fighter. The XP-80 Lulubel was designed and built to be driven by a 3,000-pound thrust de Havilland turbojet engine. When given an even stronger engine, this premier jet entered the Korean conflict in 1950 flashing a maximum speed of 594 miles per hour and a service ceiling of 46,800 feet. It had no problems knocking out the old prop planes of the North Korean Air Force. Then China entered the ring with the Soviet-made MiG-15. The aircraft was very maneuverable. 
and at a very fine high altitude capability. Uh, the F-80, it was a slower machine. It was fairly maneuverable, uh, had 50 caliber capability, but again, the airplane was not as maneuverable, it didn't have the power, it didn't have the climb rate, it didn't have the altitude capability, it didn't have the turn capability. Uh, in fact, they were just far outclassed by the MiG-15. The Air Force answered with their North American F-86 Sabre. Yet, the MiG-15 could also pull away from the F-86, which had a top speed of 695 miles per hour at 40,000 feet. 50 miles an hour slower than the MiG. Nor was it able to climb as fast or as high as this Super MiG. Yet, the victories were very one-sided in favor of the F-86. The race for speed was on as never before. The North American F-100D Super Sabre was a direct result of the lessons learned in Korea. Its single turbojet engine moved the Super Sabre 864 miles per hour, or Mach 1.3, at 40,000 feet. It had an initial climb rate of over 16,500 feet per minute, but little range. Even with the two drop tanks, maximum distance was only 1,550 miles. As the smoldering fires of Vietnam erupted into flames, multinational forces gathered on both sides of the 17th parallel. Our military aircraft went into action in February 1965, confident that this was the finest array of specialty craft ever assembled. The North American F-100 day fighter and fighter bomber, the McDonnell F-101 and the Convair F-102 interceptors, the Republic F-105 tactical fighter with both nuclear and conventional capabilities. Our air superiority model was the F-104 Starfighter, known as the missile with a man in it. It was fast, a clean 1,150 miles per hour at 50,000 feet, and could get up there in under a minute. But even with drop tanks, it only had a maximum range of 1,500 miles. Hanoi, North Vietnam, was some 800 air miles round trip from Da Nang, South Vietnam, leaving little fuel for fighting. Speed was not the only answer. Filling the void for both the U.S. Air Force and the U.S. Navy Air Service was a surprising choice. The McDonnell Douglas F-4 Phantom II had been around since 1958. Originally built as an interceptor, this durable airframe has seen many configurations over the years and set altitude and speed records. In 1959, an altitude of 98,556 feet. Then, a speed record of 1,606.51 miles per hour, and in August 1962, a low altitude speed record that stood for 16 years, 902 miles per hour. Range can mean uh, flying a long distance from the target, or the flip side of range can be endurance, where you get uh, air superiority fighters like the F-15 Eagle that the Air Force flies, or the Navy's F-14 Tomcat, that can uh, orbit for long periods of time and control uh, an awfully large hunk of airspace. In today's modern fighter planes, the Grumman F-14, the McDonnell Douglas F-15, and the General Dynamics F-16 Fighting Falcon with their multi-purpose airframes, speed has been put into a more balanced perspective. The fastest of the three fighters is the F-15 Eagle. The Eagle is an appropriate name for this proud bird, capable of soaring to great heights, a service ceiling of 85,000 feet. The two Pratt and Whitney augmented turbofans each have a thrust of almost 24,000 pounds. These mighty engines can drive the Eagle to speeds over Mach 2.5. Combine that with an initial climb rate of 44,000 feet per minute, maneuverability, and the ability to carry missiles and up to 16,000 pounds of ordnance, and you'll understand why the Air Force considers the F-15 to be its most potent fighter in service. We have 
been reading of the obituary of the dog fight for uh, approximately 50 or 60 years, but the, the old dog just won't roll over and play dead. World War I was filled with turns, rolls, dives, loops, stalls, and crashes. From the time military observers began to shoot pistols and throw monkey wrenches at each other, maneuverability took on a new significance. No longer an observer, the airplane had become a fighter, as did the men who were its pilots. One of the most agile and successful, the Sopwith F.1 Camel scored more combat victories than any other plane. Given a huge rotary engine, which developed almost uncontrollable torque, veteran pilots could make 270-degree snap turns to starboard that were faster than 90-degree turns to port, leaving a confused enemy at the mercy of its twin Vickers machine guns. At war's end, the marketplace was glutted with brand new fighter planes, many still in their crates, which were sold at ridiculously low prices to newly unemployed fighter pilots. They began a great American spectacle called barnstorming. Maneuverability became even more creative as each flying circus fought for the public's nickels, dimes, and quarters by promoting and doing more imaginative and more extreme daredevil exploits. But all was not peaceful. Both the Germans and the Russians took the opportunity to test their fighter craft in the Spanish Civil War, a prelude to World War II. Anticipating America's entrance into the conflict, the services were developing new airframes as well, such as the P-38. I'll always have a love for my first fighter plane, that's a P-38. But I enjoyed flying the P-51, especially against the Germans, even more because it was better suited to fly against the Germans than the P-38. But not at takeoff, when the agile Mustang maneuvered more like an ancient Clydesdale. Fully loaded with drop tanks and armament, lifting off the runway could be a bear of a job. When it came to a fight, the auxiliary tanks had to be dumped before it could maneuver with and outgun the opposition. The P-38 was another long-range fighter with a maximum range of 2,600 miles over the European countryside or the Pacific Ocean. And it was durable, handling the weather and the cold like no single-engine fighter. There were other fine American fighters developed for this truly global world war. The Curtis P-40, the Northrop P-61, Black Widow to name two. But the P-38 Lightning, P-47 Thunderbolt, and P-51 Mustang epitomize air superiority. Many in the military were convinced that the jet age would bring an end to the dogfight. How can you dogfight with a plane coming toward you faster than the speed of sound? You're not going to shoot everybody from a, a beyond visual range situation. Uh, and, and when that happens, you have to be able to pick, pick up the tally hose uh, as you enter a merge and be able to convert that tally ho into a kill. And that means to do close in dogfighting. That means to do basic fighter maneuvers. In Korea, when the F-86 Sabres took on those faster, more maneuverable MiG-15s, they developed a maneuver now considered a classic. They would fly the same patterns at the same speeds as their predecessors, the F-80s and F-84s. When attacked, they would jettison their wing tanks, pull into the turning MiGs, and taking advantage of our faster dive acceleration, fire short bursts from the six 50 caliber machine guns. The Sabres made air history, shooting down 792 MiG-15s while incurring less than 80 air-to-air -air losses. That's a 10 to 1 ratio. The Vietnam action saw a new plane, the General Dynamics F-111, our first successful variable swing wing plane, capable of liftoff and subsonic flight in a spread wing configuration, supersonic flight at sea level, Mach 2.5 supersonic speeds in a delta wing configuration, and the ability to fly between any two airfields on Earth. The F-111 was chosen to fly the first, and as it turned out, the only air action in a 1986 UN confrontation with Libya. 
the F-111, although it is an older airframe, is probably one of the most capable airframes in the world today when it comes to a long-range surgical strike on a specific target. It has long legs, it's capable of carrying a lot of munitions, precisely guide that munition in on a pinpoint target. Following in the footsteps of the F-111, the variable sweep wing Grumman F-14A Tomcat has become the Navy's most versatile fighter. Its mission is to attack and destroy multiple airborne targets in all weather conditions, day or night. The workload in uh, the cockpit of a modern fighter is tremendous. Uh, for instance, the F-14, as you say, can track uh, 24 targets simultaneously. That's why the F-14 is a two-seat aircraft. It has a radar intercept op operator in the back end, and he's the one who uh, tracks the targets, assigns uh, target priorities, and uh, shares the workload with the pilot so that he can concentrate on flying the airplane and conducting the fight. The Navy believes that this craft is the premier air defense fighter in the world with great range, mobility, and the ability to track those 24 targets simultaneously through its advanced weapons control system. It can attack six targets simultaneously with Phoenix missiles while continuing to scan the airspace. Yet they too will be replacing this classic with a new fighter at the start of the 21st century. The F-14, along with its other armaments mix and dirt throwing capabilities, is more than a match for threat fighters in the close-in air combat arena. The element of flying by the seat of your pants is still very valid and the fighter pilot who is aggressive with a little bit of his hair on fire is going to be one who probably does quite well given that he understands his aircraft and the performance capabilities that he has. Shoot or be shot, kill or be killed, weaponry and dogfight became the bywords of the day. That biplane heading at you doing 80 is going to fire a repeating rifle this way. But he has a surprise coming. Your Newport 11 has a Lewis gun mounted above the upper wing clearing the arc of the propeller. You'll just ease your nose toward him, fire, then roll to starboard if that lower wing holds up. Well, there's two things in a dogfight, the front and the rear. What's in front of you and what's behind you? The Fokker Scourge was shooting at you from the rear. The first machine gun synchronized to pass through the propeller blades caused havoc among the Allied planes, getting right on your tail in perfect position to shoot you down. It wasn't long before every fighter had some form of the synchronized machine gun. Aces began to mark up their kills. Some added a second gunner, although this was considered very unsportsmanlike. There was little development in warplane armament during the Roaring Twenties and the Depressed Thirties. The same twin mounted through the propeller machine guns continued to rule the day. Most with the same 30 caliber bore used in World War I. The Spanish Civil War gave the Germans and the Russians the opportunity to test their weaponry in new low-winged monoplanes as they prepared for a much bigger conflict. The British Spitfires and Hurricanes performed so admirably against the German Air Armada in the early going of World War II that their designs would influence the American pursuit ships. The United States did not enter World War II until provoked by the Japanese. Then we jumped in with both feet. Against the Luftwaffe, against the Germans, the P-51 was a much better aircraft. It looks so much like a lot of the Germans, uh, fighters in the air, that you could get in close and do more damage with it. Yet the Mustang was a great fighter. The tear-shaped canopy gave excellent visibility. That strong engine, six half-inch machine guns, and the potential of carrying eight rockets or other underwing ordnance made the P-51D, according to Colonel Hubert Zemke, the only one to command P-38, P-47, and P-51 fighter groups in Europe, the best air-to-air -air fighter of the three below 25,000 feet. Colonel Zemke preferred the P-47 Thunderbolt. He liked its ruggedness, its eight machine guns, its high-altitude performance, diving with incredible energy to catch the opposition. 
The P-38 Lightning brought down many a zero with its 20 millimeter cannon and four machine guns. Destroyers, cruisers, and more with its bombs and underwing rocket projectiles. The uh, armament also has uh, changed tremendously. Now we have uh, Gatling guns that uh, fire upwards of 6,000 rounds per minute of 20 or 30 millimeter rounds. And of course we have uh, heat seeking and radar guided air to air missiles. Rocketry in war was not new. One of the first air to air rockets was designed in 1908 as armament for dirigibles. They were given the aquatic title of aerial torpedoes. In World War II, our largest airborne rocket, Tiny Tim, carried 150 pounds of TNT in 10-foot-long containers. A solid propellant motor managed 30,000 pounds of thrust for one second. In Korea, the speed and maneuverability of the new jet fighters put a greater priority on missile development. Some even believed that the machine gun had outlived its usefulness. The F-80 and the F-86D had launchers for the 2.75 Mighty Mouse and Aeromite rockets. Soon, more sophisticated supersonic missiles, such as the Sparrow, the Falcon, and the Sidewinder, had replaced them. The Phantom F-4D fighter bomber was designed to deliver these precision-guided missiles and bombs. But when thrown into tight dogfights against MiGs in Vietnam, the need to add a nose gun became essential. The dogfight would not desist. The powers of B decided that at this point, hey, we need a gun. So in developing the next model, which was the F-4E, they built a cannon, a nose cannon, into the airplane. And it worked. Even today, a 20 millimeter nose cannon and 640 rounds of ammunition, Sparrow's semi-active radar homing missiles, Sidewinder infrared heat-seeking missiles, and other underwing ordnance will help the F-4 Phantom see service into the 21st century with many United Nations Air Forces. Replacing the F-4, the F-15 Eagle became the Air Force's most formidable fighter and a modern favorite. It has uh, a radar that has capability to see small fighter-sized targets at extreme range. And it has a uh, weapons load capability in terms of the Sparrow, AIM-120, and the AIM-9 that can uh, go up in an outnumbered scenario and in fact plan on targeting more aircraft than is in their own particular flight. Carrying up to eight tons of ordnance, speed to burn, plus a hands-on throttle and stick system to simplify combat operations, a multi-mission avionics system, and much more. The F-15's original design to be an air-to-air -air superiority fighter was built around the radar, and the radar uh, it, at that time had to be uh, fairly large, and uh, so you ended up with a large fighter. Although a favorite, its prohibitive cost dictated that only a limited quantity of F-15s could be purchased. A more modest fighter produced in large quantities had to be developed. Enter the F-16, the Fighting Falcon, winner of a lightweight fighter competition. It made its first test flight in 1974. A compact, highly maneuverable multi-role fighter with a maximum gross weight at takeoff of 37,000 pounds, over 30,000 less than the F-15 at maximum weight. Yet, many of the finest systems and refinements developed on the Eagle and the F-111 have been further enhanced and refined for use in the F-16. A major innovation designed for this airframe, the fly-by-wire flight control system uses electrical wires to relay commands, replacing the usual cables and linkage controls. The F-16 has the ability to uh, both go in and perform strike and air-to-surface missions as well as defensive counter-air or, in fact, air superiority or offensive counter-air missions. Proven in air-to-air -air combat and in air-to-surface capabilities in Israel and Desert Storm, its long combat radius and maneuverability surpasses that of all threat fighters. This small airframe carries one 20-millimeter cannon, provision for an air-to-air -air missile on each wingtip, and provision for a maximum external weapons load of over 20,000 pounds. That's why it's called the Fighting Falcon. It will remain the premier fighter plane until the next century, 
when it is replaced by the F-22. Stealth is not a new idea. From the moment anti-aircraft guns fired upon observation planes, pilots of these planes attempted to make them invisible. They painted the bottoms of their planes light blue to blend in with the sky. The tops, green, brown, sand, gray, and multicolors to blend in with the ground, polished their metal, dulled their metal. They flown out of the sun at night, hidden in cloud banks, and tried to go so fast no one could see them all in that elusive effort to be invisible. Nothing has ever been as invisible as the Lockheed F-117. The real uh, stealth techniques, I think, were basically Lockheed's brainchild, uh, came along in the 70s. All aspects of the aircraft are designed to deflect, not reflect, radar energy and the heat sources are uh, essentially what they call a black hole, where IR is very difficult to pick up any IR from them, infrared, unless you're very close to the, to the source, which is the tailpipe. So it's an advantage to have that type of technology built into your aircraft. The Lockheed F-117A stealth fighter. More has been written about it and less is actually known than any plane ever. Designed to deflect radar and reject infrared and carrying a payload internally, it was not created to fight as much as it was to be invisible to enemy fighters and ground observation, get to its target and execute its mission as a fighter bomber. So a good fighter airplane today has lethal missiles, but also matched up with uh, stealth characteristics. For instance, on the F-15 today, all the missiles are carried externally. That is not uh, consistent with stealth uh, design. So we've now had to take those missiles and put them all internally. The culmination of our modern fighter technologies are being utilized in an airframe which will carry us well into the 21st century, the Lockheed F-22. The primary role of the, of the F-22 is air-to-air -air superiority. Uh, its role, uh, as envisioned for the tactical air forces, is to uh, uh, replace the F-15 in that role, primarily because it will be a stealth airplane. The F-22 is designed to engage and defeat enemy aircraft successfully using sophisticated stealth technology, plus the maneuverability and speed capable of surpassing all current aircraft. So what you, uh, in effect, have is you take an F-15, and if you went in and gutted the center fuselage, added in the, uh, all the missiles that were external, and added in all the gas that the F-15 has to take uh, on the outside of the airplane, and put that internal, and it not weigh much more. These priorities offered many unique design challenges. To reduce the bulk and add strength to the airframe, engineers had to develop brand new lightweight composites that were super strong, highly durable, and impervious to extreme temperatures. They had to prove the capabilities of these properties through a battery of conditions. Thousands of hours were logged in wind tunnel tests. Yet only through actual flight tests are the strengths and weaknesses of any aircraft truly determined. The prototype F-22s were no exception, as they were put through every conceivable maneuver. Sometimes the results were unexpected and surprising, as when this touch-and-go exercise came to an abrupt end. Watch again in slow motion as the aircraft porpoises to impact. Fortunately, those new composites proved their durability. The cause of the accident was quickly determined and promptly corrected. Now, this airplane is designed to be supersonic. It also has a very, a most unique characteristic in that it can supercruise. And that means that it can sustain flight at supersonic speed uh, without going into afterburner. In fact, this airplane's envelope 
uh, at Super Cruise without afterburner is as good as the F-15 with afterburner. That calls for two very powerful engines developing 35,000 pounds of thrust each. With afterburner for super speeds and vectored nozzles on the back of the engine for superior maneuverability, you have a very hot airplane. But can there be a sufficient payload in a stealth airframe with speed and great range? This airplane has uh, two weapons bays. It has weapons bays on the bottom and has weapon bays on the side. Uh, it carries two types of missiles. It carries a sidewinder and it carries the AMRAM, which are the new, two new missiles uh, that the Air Force is currently developing uh, for the airplane. It also carries the cannon all consider necessary for a modern dogfight, and it has the tracking systems for success. This airplane uh, uh, is uh, sensor rich. Uh, the airplane, uh, uh, its primary sensor, of course, is a radar. And the radar is an absolutely marvel because it is uh, it's a phased array radar that uses something called a transmit receive module uh, that populates a, an array face on the airplane. These phased array radars can be considered small individual radars that supplement the primary radar system. Also, there is an electronic combat suite patterned after the Air Force's integrated electronic warfare system. Plus, communication navigation identification system in development for over 10 years. The fourth sensor system being considered is the infrared search and track. We can take all of that data and fuse that data into uh, to where the pilot can, can see it and understand it. So he does not look at four different sensors, but that sensor data is fused into one graphic demonstration presentation to the pilot. There are many other features in the F-22, such as the avionics, which can be upgraded by snapping out one module and snapping in a new one. Flat viewing panels, thin as a picture frame, combining to make the F-22 the premier air-to-air -air and air-to-ground fighter of the 21st century, bar none. The F-22 is the culmination of multi-purpose military aircraft. One hundred years before, there was but one plane. Over the years, as our needs and visions grew, we added more models of more types of aircraft, each doing their own special operation until the sky could become obliterated by the sheer numbers. As original costs and maintenance costs skyrocket faster and higher than our most powerful missiles, our visions have moved beyond specialization to the age of superior but practical multi-purpose aircraft. Fewer airframes doing more functions, longer life expectancy, modular improvement capabilities, fewer personnel and lower maintenance costs. In a sense, we have come full circle. World War I saw the simple beginnings of the fighter, easy to operate and easy to maintain, but with superior personnel, the harbinger of victory. Today, there is a singular approach to the multi-purpose fighter, functional and easy to maintain, with superior technology and personnel, the harbinger of peace. <laughs>